it has uh, drawn a certain amount of hostility. Now, some of the other speakers will refer to Miss Andrew in their own way during the course of their speeches. But I want to say at the outset that one of the common underlying themes here is the shutting out of issues concerning men and boys from the national conversation. There is a closing down of debate, particularly on controversial issues, and we will hear more about that as the time goes by. <clears throat> Men's Voices has been very active in the last year. We have upgraded and improved our uh, web page, our website, and uh, our Facebook page, on which great deal of information is posted. We have written open letters. We, we wrote open letters to Minister Francis Fitzgerald on the Istanbul Convention, and an open letter to Mary Mitchell O'Connor, the Journal Minister for Higher Education, uh, on the occasion of an announcement of yet another task force on gender equality. We have also rewritten some documents, produced some new documents during the year. We have extensively revised and rewritten our family law page. We have written a discussion document on education, which we sent to the Joint Heritage Committee on Education, asking for a hearing at the same time. We didn't get leave to make a presentation before the, at the committee, but we did meet with the chair of the committee, Deputy Fiona O'Loughlin, who gave us, I will say, a good hearing. We sent a document to the Justice Committee on domestic violence and on the Istanbul Convention. Again, we asked for leave to appear before the, the committee to make a presentation. Again, we did not get leave Make a, to, to have a hearing. So we, instead we set about meeting individual members of the committee. We met with five members of the Justice Committee, including the Chair, uh, Deputy O'Quailon, and the Sinopolis spokesman, Jim O'Callaghan. I will say that in the case of all the five people that we met, we got a, a very good hearing, a very respectful hearing, and I believe we put before them facts that they had never heard before. We have had opportunities in the past year to check out the attitude of many elements of the Irish media on men and men's issues. We made calls to senior journalists in the main national daily, to current affairs programs in RTE, Newstalk, and Today FM. In all cases, we saw space, or we saw time, to present our views on issues concerning men and boys, which we felt were being neglected. In the case of the three days, we had no success. No. In the case of national radio, we have had almost no success either, apart from one fleeting appearance on a, an RTE news program there some weeks ago. In the case of local radio, I would say we had much more success. We got appearances on quite a few of the local radio stations, and we were even invited back several times on, on a couple, two or three of these stations. I will say that we found the attitude of local radio much more open and much more receptive to uh, men's issues and the problems that were uh, besetting men today than, than with the, the national, uh, the national journal, the, uh, journalists. We had, as I say, um, the, no success with national uh, uh, press, but we had uh, the journal that I invited us to write three opinion pieces during the year on aspects of our own choosing. We did that. There were two pieces in the Sunday Times, written by Sunday Times journalists, were dealing with activities of men's voices, and dealing with them, I believe, in a positive way as well. Now, whereas in the past, we had spoken, we had used careful language. When we were referring to media attitude, we had spoken about the neglect of or indifference to men's issues. We now believe it is worse than that as a result of our experiences in the last year. We now think that there is good reason to believe that there is a deliberate policy to exclude male issues and the male side of many controversial issues from the discussion. 
Now that sounds rather stress, strong. So I'll say a little more. I thought I made calls to the three opinion editors, editors of the, of the three main national days. In the case of one of them, despite re repeated attempts, I didn't get through at all. In the case of the other two, I spoke with the opinion editor of one and with a senior journalist with another. In each case, I sought permission to write an opinion piece on issues of concern to me. Their attitude, or their, the routine was attended. They said, send us in a piece, and we will consider it. We did, and there was no response. In case of one of these dailies, we did a follow-up, actually. We wrote the second time, and this time to the editor. And we pointed out that his paper never, almost never featured issues of concern to men, whereas they, they covered issues for almost any other group. Again, we got no response to that. Funnily enough, in the case of the second daily that I spoke about, three months after our initial approach, and entirely unconnected with it, we got a call from a journalist complimenting us on our website and asking us to write a piece saying that he would put it up on the online version. We did. We wrote a long piece, spent a good deal of time at it, sent it in. A few days later, we got a call from the journalist saying he wanted to tidy up a few loose ends, but he expected it would be put up online in a few hours. It never appeared. We rang the journalist and asked him why. He was clearly embarrassed, shamefaced. He made some feeble excuse and, and, and hung up. It was obvious to us that I had been blocked by a senior editor. And that is another reason why we say there is a closing down of the way here. Now, if you contrast the, um, the treatment we got, compare this with uh, the attention given to other organizations, let's say women's organizations such as the National Women's Council, Women's Aid, Safe Ireland, and, 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 and the others. They are regularly featured in the opinion columns of the daily papers, and on national radio as well. Every time they bring out an annual report, they are given leave to write about it. And there are other occasions when they are featured as well, as when they uh, bring out what they call a special report, or even when they are having a, a conference of some kind. They get generous coverage every time. And the same is true for national radio. They get the same coverage on national radio for, our, for these uh, events that there. And when on radio, it is quite noticeable that they are treated with a deference which is not extended to any other group. It's a softy, softy approach. There are no hard questions. We have had occasion also in the past to challenge RTE on what I would say called biased reporting. <coughs> Once was on the Ask Consent campaign, that was some time ago, and on twice on the domestic violence. The last time we challenged was um, back last February, there was a, an RTE TV uh, bulletin at 9 o'clock on Sunday night, where it had an extended item on domestic violence. Now, it was noticeable that on the previous Friday, the then minister, Francis Gerald, had placed her domestic violence bill before the irrelevance. So the two were connected. <coughs> on that TV item, there were interviews with the directors of the National Women's Council and the Women's Aid. There were images of battered women. There was footage of a, a Women's Aid call center. There was no mention at all of male victims of domestic violence or of a support group for male victims. Two of us made separate complaints. First, to RTE, and when we didn't get any satisfaction from RTE, we then complained to the BAI. In either case, was our complaint of help. But we did get a grudging acceptance from RTE that, in hindsight, they should have made mention of male victims but they absolutely denied that this constituted bias of any kind or discrimination. <coughs> there is, at present, 
a domestic violence bill for your this, which contains a new emergency barrier order, already to be turned. This order is based on Article 52 of the Istanbul Convention. And those of you who were at this conference last year will remember well uh, the uh, kind of document, kind of awful document this Istanbul Convention is. Now, this provision has been enacted in order to pave the way for the, uh, for the ratification of the Istanbul Convention, which is expected in the first half of next year. I want to say a word about this uh, barring order. There is an existing barring order in operation, under whereby one party can apply to have the other party removed from the, the residence if they can show that they are in danger of immediate harm. If they can show they're in danger of immediate harm, then the other party is removed immediately from the residence. But in that case, the applicant must have at least an equal share of the property. At least an equal share, a 50% share in the property in order to make the application. But that requirement has now been abolished in the case of the new owner. In other words, the person making the application will have no interest whatsoever in the property. And they can still apply to have the rightful owner evicted from their own property if they can show that they're in danger of remaining. Likewise, in the past, the two people had to be in what is known as an intimate and permitted relationship. Now, in the, the definition of that in the past was that they had to be living together for at least six months before the application was made. But again, that requirement, that time duration, has now been abolished as well. So there is no time duration required for what constitutes an intimate, an intimate and permitted relationship. So for all we know, it's up in the air. It's, it's so vague. It's open to any interpretation. And our fear is that the following scenario can occur. A man could uh, bring a woman into his residence, into his home. They could live there for a few weeks. Then a risk occurs. There is a row. And the woman then applies for an emergency guarding order to have the rightful owner evicted from their own property while she continues to remain there. And then we don't know how, how long. It, it hasn't been decided <coughs> for how long. This is the kind of bizarre thing that has happened there today. Now, in a Sunday Times article last June, we drew attention to the fact that the constitutionality of this emergency bearing order had been raised, the question of its constitutionality had been raised as far back as 2014 by the Attorney General, known as the President and the Attorney General of the State, questioned the, the uh, constitutionality. Do you think that this, you would have thought that this would have caused the media to sit up and take notice? It would have caused the media to actually bring in legal experts to scrutinize this, this uh, order itself, and indeed to scrutinize the Istanbul Convention from which it is derived in the first place anyway, to, to, to look at these um, documents and ask, is this order in constitution? Or are there other elements of the Istanbul Convention which are also in constitution? Do you think that happened? Not a good one. No. There was no interest in the part of the media. That is why I'm saying there is a complete closing down of the debate on controversial issues of this kind. Neither the government want to debate on it, nor the media. The media is complicit in this. This constitutes, in our view, this closing down a debate on matters of controversy of this kind constitutes a threat to free speech. Going on there. Now, it's, it's not only us that are raising the question of the threat to free speech. In fact, in the last few weeks, we've been watching the, the media, there have been expressions of concern from different quarters in our public life about the threat to free speech that exists today. You can put what I've just said about closing down the debate alongside certain other uh, 
um, occurrences in the last number of months. Take the Low Platform campaign, which operates in, in many uh, university campuses today, particularly in the US and UK, whereby if the speaker is deemed, if, if this, the views of the speaker are deemed to be in conflict with the views of a certain controlling student cabal in that campus, they are denied the right to speak. Again, this is a threat to freedom. This is actually a denial of freedom. If you take another event, there was a speaker originally scheduled to speak here today who had to pull out, pull out, give his own reasons for himself. But in, in another uh, post, he spoke about the attempts to attack him and to silence him because of another article he had written some time ago. This goes back several months, or back to May of this year. There is yet another event that I could mention. In the past four months, two journalists have been peremptorily dismissed in this state for utterances which are deemed offensive. Now, however you judge of that, their instant dismissal without a hearing or even a semblance of process strikes us as lynch law. What is coming next? We fear that another basic principle of the law is under attack. That is the principle of the law which says that an innocent person, or sorry, an accused person is deemed to be innocent, presumed innocent, until guilty is proven. We, we fear that that too is being undermined. This law has been in, in existence for hundreds of years. Among other things, it's a safeguard against false accusations. To save an innocent person to false accusation. How do I, why do I say it may be undermined? The most obvious example is, is in that, on that contentious area where there is an allegation of rape. As a result of the ask consent aim and the focus on consent, attention is focused on the accused person, demanding for him to, to show how he knows he got consent. So and so, that the onus is as much on him to prove his innocence as on the accused, on the, on, on the prosecution to prove his guilt. I was going to say a bit more about the Istanbul Convention, but uh, because of time constraints, I'm, I'm going to bring this address to an end. But before I do so, I want to make it a frank appeal. Men's Voices has no resources of any kind. We have no money. We get no funding from the state or anywhere. Whatever we do, whatever expenses we incur, has to be met out of our own pockets. Now, if you feel that what we've been doing over the last two years it has been, uh, has been is worth supporting, if you feel that we have made a difference to the public debate on, on issues of concern to men and boys, then I would ask you, I appeal to you, uh, to contribute whatever you can uh, today. There are um, collection boxes down here at the end. Um, and we also have a bank account number, and you can get that from one of us, from me, or from one of the uh, other three people. And, 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 and if you wish to make a, a donation to the bank. <coughs> so I, I will now uh, draw this um, to a conclusion, so we'll, we will move on to the next item on the agenda, which is. Who's <coughs> next? Uh -huh. <coughs> uh, okay.